You're going to learn a lot about prostate cancer over the next few days, but it's important to begin with a message that will resonate with everyone. It's a message about family and community, and perhaps most importantly, a message about hope. To deliver that message is our 2024 keynote speaker, Deborah Roberts. Deborah is an award-winning ABC News correspondent, co-anchor of 2020, and a New York Times bestselling author. She's also the wife of NBC's Al Roker, who was diagnosed with prostate cancer in 2020. He has since become an advocate for screening, particularly in Black men. And I'd like to say thank you to Bear for partnering with Zero on today's keynote address. Deborah, thank you so much for joining us today. It's a pleasure to be with you, Shelby. Prostate cancer is a family disease. You and your husband have been incredibly open about your cancer experience, but we know all too well how challenging that can be. So I want to thank you in advance for sharing all of these experiences with us. The power of sharing one's story can be incredibly impactful, and I know that the Zero community is excited to hear from you. The floor is yours. Thank you again, Shelby, and it is a pleasure to be here with you and with all of you out there, too. I hope you are all uh, enjoying the beginning of this new year uh, as we make our way through it and as we make our way, hopefully, out of winter. If you're in a warm weather climate, eh, you're probably not so worried about it. But if you're freezing like the rest of us, there is hope, right? Let's hang on to hope. Pardon the weather analogies, but you'll understand more about that in just a little bit. But the word is hope. And I want to make sure that we infuse this speech today with that. It is a pleasure to be here with you to join this discussion about prostate cancer. It is a subject that we don't talk about nearly enough. And as we all know, we've had some recent reminders of just how vitally important it is. Just recently, we learned that Dexter King, the youngest son of Martin Luther King Jr., died from prostate cancer just a week shy of his 63rd birthday, 63. And of course, this was on the heels of the revelation that Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin was diagnosed with prostate cancer and suffered complications after his treatment. Our hearts went out to the families of both men who no doubt are struggling with coming to terms with the loss, but also in the case of Secretary Austin, dealing with the journey of the battle, and it is definitely a journey. Consider this, 300,000 men hear that diagnosis, prostate cancer, every year. And the disease claims about 35,000 lives a year. It is critical that we talk more openly and more honestly about this disease, and not just for the men in our lives, but for those of us who love them. Cancer of any form doesn't just affect the person who is coping with the illness. It also affects their families and their friends, too, those who are in their orbit. And the number of us affected is sadly slowly creeping up. And I say us because, as you just heard, my family is in that number, too. Four years ago, my husband, Al Roker, was diagnosed. And it is a moment and a time that huh, we will never forget. I still vividly remember the phone call that I got from him on his way home from a routine medical follow-up exam, an exam, by the way, that he neglected to tell me about. I knew he had had a complete physical and he had had his blood work done. And I knew that his thorough physician checked everything, including his PSA number. He noticed that it was a bit high and he did some digging and he called Al in for what he thought was going to be a chat, a follow-up chat. But instead, it turned out to be the conversation. My husband called me from the car on his way home trying his best to sound nonchalant. But when he asked me if I was going to be home in an hour, and he kept insisting, I just need to talk to you, I knew something was up. He declined to talk specifically by phone, but when he got home, he uttered that dreaded word, cancer. I nearly lost it, and he did too. Neither of us had ever expected to hear that. After all, he had worked so well to, on his health. He tried to stay healthy. Uh, he had no obvious symptoms. So how could he have prostate cancer? 
Well, I quickly remembered what a good friend had told me when her father-in-law was diagnosed, and that is, if a man lives long enough, he is likely to get prostate cancer. Six in 10 prostate cancers are diagnosed in men 65 and older, and my husband was that age. Well, after some crying and some moments of intense fear, we decided that it was time to stand up and get to work. Sadly, we both had had experience with the cancer journey. I had lost my father to colon cancer. Al lost his dad to lung cancer years before. And between the two of us, we had had a number of other relatives who had dealt with different types of cancer. And fortunately, nearly all of them had survived. But prostate cancer was uncharted waters for us. We knew a few things. We knew it's a subject not widely talked about in the Black community. We also knew that the risk is higher for men of African ancestry, who also suffer disproportionately, unfortunately, from more aggressive forms of the disease, which is what my husband heard about his diagnosis. As journalists who read and research a lot, we knew a little bit more than most people about prostate can cancer. We were keenly aware that Black men are often diagnosed later as the cancer has had a chance to spread, which can lead to more tragic outcomes. But there was so much that we didn't fully understand about treatment, the prognosis, and we knew we'd had to get up to speed quickly. And fortunately for us, we're living in New York City where we have access to top-notch cancer experts and care. We also had friends who were connected to the renowned Sloan Memorial Kettering Hospital, one of our country's leading research and cancer care centers. So we had a pretty good place to get started. But in the meantime, our goal was to equip ourselves with knowledge, with optimism, and in the case of Al Roker, of course, a positive spirit. He is known for that. But for the first time, my husband's sunny outlook on life didn't come so easily for him. We decided to say nothing in the beginning publicly about his battle. As you might imagine, only our closest family members and a couple of friends knew the truth. We had to wrap our mind around this stunning news, and trust me, it was pretty stunning. Even with an optimistic prognosis, which is what we had from his doctors, there were a lot of questions that we had to be answered what treatments would be best, how soon, what would the future look like for him as a man? And we know that those are the big questions, the big concerns for a lot of men who are diagnosed. I put my investigative hat on and we began to look for answers and options, surgery, radiation, or simply waiting a bit. All of these things were on the table. But once we began to do a little bit more research and to visit a number of doctors, Al decided that surgery is what he wanted as soon as possible. That was the way he wanted to go. Though he had an option to wait, my husband's not that good at waiting, so he decided action was what he wanted. His doctors felt confident that he would be all right and would make a full recovery. We went into surgery with that knowledge, but it was a little bit daunting, I have to tell you. We are a family of a deep faith, but we were scared. And of course, my husband, like any other man, had deeply personal worries about sexual performance. I asked him if I could talk about that, and he gave me permission. Because it is the unspoken and delicate part of this discussion that prevents so many men from either seeking treatment or even giving voice to prostate cancer. Let's face it, it goes to the core of their manhood, and this is something that they don't always feel easy talking about. But the reality is that prostate cancer doesn't have to be a death sentence. If it is caught early, which fortunately his was, and treated early, there's hope for a good outcome. There is so much to be hopeful about. Consider this statistic. The vast majority, more than 90% of cases, are caught early, and they typically don't require chemo or surgery. And Al didn't have to have that. That discovery offered us so much more hope. As somebody said, cancer is a word, 
not a sentence. And we really felt that. After surgery, my husband was extremely motivated to recover. You know his personality, maybe many of you do. And we were surprised by how good he felt, with the exception of the catheter. His surgeon suggested that he begin walking as soon as possible, maybe starting off making his way up to a mile or two a day. But of course, Al Roker being Al Roker, went for a two to three mile walk around the park and one spell swoop. He's a bit competitive, what can I say? His doctor later clarified that he met a mile or two over the course of a day, but fortunately, Al was healing and feeling well. And he wanted to go for it, and he was up and back to work in less than two weeks. He was surprised by how uneventful the process was. And as he continued to make progress, he decided that he couldn't remain silent. As a husband, as a father, as a TV personality, and as a Black man, he felt that he could actually have an impact, that this was a moment that he could affect other men of color. He felt that he owed it to others in the community to share his journey with the hopes of urging others to get tested and to break the silence around this disease. We worried a little bit about that. Did he really want to become a national symbol for cancer? Because once you speak publicly, that does happen. No longer just a well-known morning show weather reporter and TV personality, but as a cancer survivor, was he ready for that? Well, Al decided it was something he needed to do, and I couldn't have been prouder of him, and the same is true for the rest of our family. We were really behind him in every way. Prostate cancer needs to be discussed as openly and as honestly, and even as casually as breast cancer, lung cancer, skin cancer, any other commonly diagnosed disease. We need to end the stigma that maybe leaves men feeling ashamed or reluctant to share their journey and to offer hope to others who may not have the information and may not feel that sense of hope. There's an expression, there's always hope beyond what you can see. And we really began to feel that in our family. While I know nothing about the diagnosis or the circumstances involving Secretary of Defense Lloyd Austin, whom I mentioned earlier, I will say this. When we heard that he had had a mysterious surgery and some complications that took him to the hospital, my first suspicion was that it might have been prostate cancer. My heart went out to the defense secretary because as a black woman whose husband is a black man, and who's traveled that path, I could only imagine the discomfort that he, a career military man at age 70, likely felt in disclosing such a personal battle. My brother, a retired Air Force sergeant, was diagnosed with uh, prostate cancer a few years ago, and he really didn't speak much about it in the very beginning. I think he felt a level of embarrassment or shame maybe even weakness, a common emotion for a lot of men who are going through it. So I understand too well the difficulty many have in disclosing their journeys. As I said, I don't pretend to know anything about Secretary Austin's case, but my heart ached for him. And our prayers go out to him and his family that he makes a full recovery. And from what we've been told by the Pentagon, it seems like he will. His prognosis sounds like it'll be good. And that is the message, I hope, more than anything that we get across in this event today. The news is promising. More than 3.3 million men, we are told, have been diagnosed and are thriving today, really living their lives after that scary diagnosis of prostate cancer. It's true what they say. You're braver than you believe and you're stronger than you seem. We certainly learned that during our journey. And that's not just good news for those who are fighting cancer, but let's face it, it's good news for their caregivers. And if you're a caregiver, and I know there are some of you out there who are, you know that you're fighting the battle too. Caregivers are in the trenches, 
And we don't always think about the stress and the fear and the exhaustion that we feel. And that is real. My husband didn't want a nurse to follow us home, even though I thought we should have a nurse. So you can only guess who was doing the running up and down the stairs to get his medicine, to help him with his catheter bags. Not really a lot of fun those first few days. Um, but anyone who has been a caregiver knows that you become a nurse, a chef, an assistant, a therapist, a cheerleader, anything your loved one needs during recovery. Caregivers are often overlooked and undervalued. They are the unsung heroes in the cancer fight because the battle involves the entire family or friend group, whoever cares enough to just sort of roll up their sleeves and offer to help. And let's remember that most of us are not trained. We're just kind of making it up as we go along with love and tenderness, hopefully, most of the time anyway. <laughs> But it can be challenging and scary. Caregiving is a real balancing act, especially when you're caring for other members of your family who need you too. And when you're in it, often you're not thinking that you've also got to think about yourself and take care of yourself. During those early days of Al's recovery, my brother called me to check on him, but also to remind me to take care of myself to recharge. And for those of you who are caregivers, first of all, let me say bravo to you. Know that we are singing your praises. You are doing important and selfless work. You don't get enough acknowledgement or recognition. And sometimes you don't even hear that from the person you're caring for, that's for sure, because they're dealing with something. But you do not go unnoticed. <clears throat> you are one of the keys to a cancer patient's survival, and never forget that. My husband has often sweetly said uh, on many occasions when we're talking with people about his multiple battles of things that he's dealt with, and he'll say to me, you're the reason I'm alive. And that's very sweet, but I'll say, no, nah, that's really between you and the good Lord. I just did what I could to be there and support and comfort you. And at the end of the day, that's all we can expect from a caregiver. There are a lot of you who are doing some major comforting right now, and I hope you know that your sacrifice matters so much more than you will ever know. I want to close today by saying that for all of you who are dealing with this journey, this prostate cancer journey, that I hope and I pray that conferences like this will give you strength and will give you courage and also a feeling of community. I urge you to remember that whether you're fighting cancer or any other kind of battle, you can choose to be a victim or a survivor. And today I'm here to say, let's choose to be survivors. Thank you all so much for listening. And Shelby, I'm happy to join you for any questions anybody might have. Thank you. That was incredible. I was um, not on video, but on the edge of my seat over here and nodding and, and smiling and laughing, which is always so strange to do in this in my recording space. <laughs> uh, but thank you so much for, for your openness. Um, it's just wonderful to have an insight into you and your family's prostate cancer journey. We appreciate the vulnerability and, and thank you to Al for letting you um, discuss some of the the big challenges and, and some of the more stigmatizing parts of the conversation. Uh, excuse me. When we when we announced recently that um, you were going to be our our summit keynote speaker, uh, we we had so much excitement, and some of our attendees reached out with a few questions. So um, if you don't mind, I'm going to go through. Just I, I won't I won't grill you, but just a few. Um, if we could get your take, that would be wonderful. Happy to. Uh, so, you know, we, you talked about the moment that you got the call uh, about Al's diagnosis and, um, you know, just how kind of earth shattering those types of calls can be or conversations can be when you when you hear those words. Um, and so many people listening into our summit um, can relate to that. So, you know, how did you find your way out of that just initial shock? 
I think uh, for all of us, it is very different, of course, but I happen to be married to a man who, for the most part, is uh, pretty optimistic. And uh, his first response was, of course, fear, but then he quickly shifted to a place of wanting to make sure that I was okay, but also to kind of think positively. That's kind of who he is. And his doctor had given him some positive um, projections that, you know, he felt they caught it early. So he, soon after we sort of, you know, lost it, began to think positively. Let's think about what we can do. So I would say within a day, you know, we were already out there and charging, um, you know, trying to find the doctor we wanted to talk to and calling friends who might be able to refer us. And, you know, I think we felt that time was of the essence, even though it was not a critical situation at that moment. He's the kind of person who likes to, if if he's got a flat tire or if he's got anything wrong with the car, he wants it dealt with right away. So this was the same kind of thing when it came to his health. He wanted to jump on it. And of course, I had to pull myself together to be there for him. So it helped that he had a um, naturally positive spirit. And that guided us a lot along the way. Yeah, absolutely. I think oftentimes patients have a diagnosis or get a diagnosis and feel like there is a sense of urgency. I have this cancer inside me. I have to make a decision now. But really... Um, you know, you can take a, a, a couple of days, even weeks in some cases, of course, in communication with your provider, but really wrap your arms around what are the options, what are the pros and cons. So, um, yeah, real, absolutely. Thank you for, for driving that home. Um, I loved so much what you said in your address about um, you and Al feeling like you could truly give this disease a voice. Um, you're absolutely right. I'm sure everyone listening understands the stigma Um, that is unfortunately attached to prostate cancer, how scary it can be um, to talk about. And you you already hit on this a little bit, but I wondered if you could share even more about um, what really made you and Al decide, you know, we have to share this. We have to kind of go public and talk about it. Interestingly, he had uh, reported on, I guess, a story about, uh, you know, black men and health and so forth. So he had sort of reported a little bit on the importance of black men talking about their health, whether it's cancer or other kinds of diseases. So he had a certain awareness and I guess a feeling that he could be a role model in some ways, just in giving any giving voice to any kind of a conversation. But I think for me, working alongside my um, wonderful colleague, Robin Roberts, who so bravely talked about her breast cancer battle, I think it was sort of clear to both of us after a while that we could be an influence for for positivity, for change, for good. And I think because he is such an open book, (laughs) sometimes a little too open, um, he is the kind of person who I think after a while doesn't want to have uh, secrecy or a vacuum. And people knew uh, that he had been away from work for a little while. And I, I think he, uh, you know, recognized that there was an opportunity here. There was an opportunity. And both of us feel very strongly about trying to offer um, uh, help to our communities or just community at large in any kind of way. So I think it was kind of a natural thing for him to talk about it after a while. And particularly because he had a good prognosis and he was feeling pretty good. In fact, Al talked about feeling a little guilty in a way because he wasn't suffering like you might imagine with chemo or radiation or all of that. He had his surgery he had to recover from. But other than that, he said he felt fine. So he thought this is a message that he can drive home to people, that you really can live a full life and and get back to yourself. So it was was kind of um, a, a no brainer, I think, for both of us to be public about it. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I will say, you know, that that survivor's guilt um, or I'm not having these, these terrible side effects guilt, whatever you're going to call it, um, is is very, very real. So, um, you know, he, he is absolutely not alone in that. Um, just a couple more questions and then I'll 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 leave you. Um, but, you know, you know, uh, hearing the words, we will we'll, we have a lot of newly diagnosed folks listening in. Um, But hearing those words, you've got cancer, you've got prostate cancer, you know, they're overwhelming, they're isolating. Could you share a bit more? I know you had a great treatment team at Sloan Kettering. They're amazing. Um, But share a little bit more, if you don't mind, about how you uh, got support and who you turned to for credible information. 
Well, as I said, we were fortunate enough to have friends who were connected to either Sloan or even Dana Farber over in uh, Massachusetts to a number of areas. Some of them uh, professionally, I've done stories. Al uh, has too, and I know people. So that was just critical for us to be able to actually know somebody who can point you in a direction. And even when we weren't talking about it, we knew who the top guy was who is handling non-invasive prostate surgery. We got the name pretty quickly and we reached out. I mean, again, we are predisposed, I think, to be a little pushy because both, both of us are in the TV world. Uh, whereas a lot of people might be a little bit more reticent because it's something that they have to not only wrap their minds around, but educate themselves. But I think just being able to talk to people, and even if you're not in a New York and you don't have access to this kind of um, um, expertise, wherever you live, there are great places. My sister who lives in Miami and who is a breast cancer survivor, you know, reached out to her hospital down there and quickly found, you know, a, a great a doctor uh, and an oncologist who could give her some thoughts and advice and went to she went to go see her. I, I would say more than anything else, you have to just kind of pull yourself together and realize that you have to be an advocate for you, the person that you're trying to help, but also for yourself if it's you that you're dealing with only and and just educating yourself. You know, these days you can do a lot of that online. You can actually learn who um, some of the providers are, what some of the top notch. I wouldn't say Google the the, the fees to find out how best to do it. I think most doctors would say don't Google. But I would say just trying to reach out to find out who those people are so that you can educate yourself. Because I think for a lot of people, that's what's so daunting. You don't know what to do. What treatment should I, you know, go for? Uh, Ultimately, that's your choice. But you want to just know what the what the odds are and what the statistics are with one over the other. So I think reaching out to either friends or family, if you do have somebody who has been in that world, and let's face it, we all know somebody who's been on that journey somewhere, whether it's prostate cancer or not, and just educating yourself and learning and and, and not being shy about speaking up. You cannot be reticent. This is your life or your family member's life you're speaking about. So be pushy, be aggressive, assertive, and don't hold back. Yeah, absolutely. I couldn't agree more. I mean, we know at zero that empowered and education educated patients uh, live longer. They have better outcomes. Uh, they have higher quality of life. Um, and I think a lot of times uh, patients or, or someone diagnosed, um, they worry that, you know, they're questioning their doctor's um, guidance. But really, those questions and that education and empowerment is is truly making their doctors better at their job as well. Um, and, and, you know, it's not a disrespectful thing to do to ask uh, questions and, and for second opinions even. So, um, yeah, I couldn't, couldn't agree more. Okay, last question, I promise. Uh, but I, I, I want to thank you for speaking directly to our caregivers and our care partners out there. They are an absolutely integral part of this process. Um, and, and you're right, they often do kind of fly under the radar. They, what, what they're doing go, goes um, sometimes unnoticed, not probably by the person diagnosed, but, but by some others. Um, but what are some ways that you took care of you, um, you know, like your family was insuring? Uh, so, you know, how did, how did you uh, ensure that you could, in fact, care for Al during this and, and kind of maintain that uh, in charge. That's an important conversation because, you know, these days we hear so much about self-care, right? It sounds kind of woo-woo, self-care. But it really is important when you're in the trenches and you're working to help somebody take care of themselves. Um, I think for me, I'm an exercise fanatic. You know, I like to go to the gym. I like to run. So that's a big release for me, knowing that I can sort of get outside and just, even if it's just going for a walk. I mean, when Al was having his surgery, I left. He happened to be having the surgery at a place that was near the um, the East River in New York. I left and went out for a walk along the river just to sort of clear my head. So I think making time for yourself to go out uh, and, and seek some sunshine and some air that is critical. But also if you're the kind of person who meditates or you're a, 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 a spiritual, prayerful person, you know, and, and there, there's something that you can do to go off and just, you know, clear your mind to, to, to pray or to think. Uh, I just think all of those things add up. Little things like just going to the grocery store and hutzing around or going shopping and buying a new pair of shoes or whatever, just something for yourself. 
I think those little moments, it's almost like a little release on the valve because you can get into a cycle, kind of a loop where you're just caring for the person and doing your, uh, you know, whatever they need done and very little for yourself. And that can start to add up and become corrosive. And it also can lead to some resentment and, and, and just all kinds of exhaustion. So I think more than anything else, find that thing that relaxes you most. Go out. I mean, if you're the kind of person who does massages, make yourself an appointment. Do not feel guilty about it. If you have young children, have somebody come in and, you know, help look after the kids so you can go out and go take care of something, even mundane things, uh, walking the dog. I think all of those things matter and they add up. And you have to just remember that you're better able to take care of somebody else if you're stronger and in good shape yourself. So Absolutely. Feel guilty about caring for you. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, well, exercise and retail therapy. That's what I heard. <laughs> what? That I, that's what, that's we're, what we're going with. Maybe we're retail offer. therapy first. <laughs> uh, well, Deborah, I can't thank you enough um, for being a part of Zero's Prostate Cancer Summit. We truly appreciate your time, your commitment to raising awareness, especially awareness among Black men who are at the highest risk, and ultimately your message of hope. So thank you so much. My pleasure. Take care, everybody. Take care. Hello, I'm Nicole Danello, Vice President Prostate Marketing at Bayer Pharmaceuticals. I want to extend my deepest thanks to Deborah for sharing her and Al's experiences with prostate cancer. Their story underscores the critical role that partners, families, and friends of those with prostate cancer play. As Deborah shared, a prostate cancer diagnosis not only impacts the person diagnosed, but their loved ones too. Everyone's prostate cancer journey takes a different path, but it is essential that as a community affected by this disease, we come together to continue to advocate for access to new treatments and to share important information as well as support one another. For me personally, I lost a dear friend, Vince, to prostate cancer. And I often think about how far we've come today and how recent advances could have potentially helped him. My grandfather, a World War II veteran was also diagnosed and treated for prostate cancer. Being close to friends and family impacted by the disease taught me the importance of cherishing every moment with loved ones. I know that one day we will conquer this disease and spare others such heartache. Sharing our stories and our experiences with prostate cancer is more important than ever. And there is an urgent need for early detection, particularly within the black community. Here in the U.S., Black men are 70% more likely to be diagnosed with prostate cancer and more than twice as likely to die than their white counterparts. At Bayer, these personal stories fuel our commitment to fighting prostate cancer. Deborah's story of the roller coaster of emotions her family faced and the unwavering hope she holds truly illustrates the why of what we do on our dedication to continuing to advance innovative research with the goal of improving the lives of people living with cancer. For those of you seeking further inspiration, I invite you to explore more patient stories on our YouTube channel. Thank you all again for joining us at Zero's Virtual Summit. Your participation is vital in fostering a community committed to understanding and fighting prostate cancer.